Hi guys, my name is Alex, and today we'll delve into the case of a girl who vanished from her own bedroom in the middle of the night just before Christmas. This case quickly gained massive attention. Over 3,000 people joined the search efforts, and eventually, detectives were able to uncover some chilling facts that led them to an unexpected and shocking truth. Sarah Foxwell was born on May 18, 1998, in Salisbury, Maryland. She grew up in a big family with two sisters and four brothers. Her mother also had three more kids from a previous marriage. Eventually, Sarah's parents divorced and her mom faced tough times, having to take care of all of the kids on her own. She had to work a lot, so the kids often stayed with relatives. Sarah was the middle child, always trying to keep the peace among her siblings when they were arguing and fighting. She always radiated positivity and usually succeeded in bringing her family together. In December 2009, when Sarah was 11, she temporarily moved in with her aunt and grandparents. Christmas was coming and her mom was working extra shifts to buy gifts for every kid. Her aunt lived on the outskirts of Salisbury in a large farmhouse. The kids loved it there because of the vast space to play around. On December 22nd, everything seemed normal. With just three days until Christmas, the kids were in high spirits, running around the house, playing, and just having fun. Their aunt ordered pizza for dinner, and around 9 p.m., they all started getting ready for bed. Sarah slept in the same room with her six-year-old sister, Emma, at the end of the hallway near the back door. They chatted for a bit and fell asleep. The next morning, Sarah's grandpa woke up and went to wake the kids. He went into the girls' room but found only Emma there. Thinking that Sarah might have already woken up, he searched the entire house but couldn't find her. He told her aunt about it and they started to search every corner together. Eventually, they realized that Sarah wasn't in the house her aunt thought she might have gone outside to play in the snow that had fallen overnight, but she quickly realized Sarah's shoes and jacket were still at home. Then, her aunt noticed something strange. Sarah's toothbrush was missing from its usual spot in the bathroom. After searching the area around the house with her grandpa and finding no signs of Sarah, her aunt decided to call her mother. She rushed over and they contacted the police. The officers arrived within minutes and immediately began searching the house. Sarah's aunt told them that she always checked all the doors and windows every night before bed, and she had done so the previous evening as well. The police couldn't find Sarah anywhere inside the house or nearby. Upon learning about the missing toothbrush, the officers began to consider the possibility of an abduction. Maybe the kidnapper grabbed this item before leaving the house with Sarah so they decided to check if all the doors and windows were indeed locked. As they approached the back door next to Sarah's room and tried the handle, it opened right away. Sarah's aunt swore the door was locked the night before and hadn't been opened since. However, she remembered they kept a spare key outside near the entrance. She went there and checked it, but the key wasn't there. This further supported the abduction theory. The fact that the perpetrator knew about the spare key suggested that he knew the family quite well. Another unsettling detail was that their dog hadn't made a sound that night, despite usually barking at strangers. Fearing that Sarah might have been kidnapped, investigators immediately initiated a large-scale search. News of her disappearance spread rapidly and many local residents contacted the police, offering their help. The sheriff appealed to the public through the media, asking them to check their properties for anything that might look suspicious. Dozens of local officers were called for the search. They also got help from neighboring towns' departments and even other states. They all hoped to find Sarah alive. Given that the perpetrator had taken her toothbrush, it might indicate his plans to keep her alive, so the police devoted all their resources to the search. Outside the house, they found their first lead, there were relatively fresh tire tracks in the snow, indicating that the abductor likely arrived by car. 
Since all of Sarah's warm clothing was left behind, it was clear that the perpetrator couldn't have taken her on foot. Meanwhile, Sarah's relatives were brought to the police station, where something unexpected happened. Sarah's six-year-old sister, Emma, who slept in the same room with her, tugged at her grandmother's sleeve and whispered that she had a secret. She saw the person who took Sarah. According to the girl, she woke up to this man saying something to her sister. Emma didn't understand what was happening, but got scared, so she pretended to be asleep. A few moments later, she saw the man leave the room with Sarah. This story shocked her relatives, but then Emma said something even more chilling. She recognized the man. It was Mr. Tommy. The adults immediately knew exactly who she meant. It was 30-year-old Thomas Legs, the former boyfriend of Sarah's aunt. Although they had broken up a few months ago, he had spent a lot of time at their house, and all the kids knew him well. The police were also familiar with Thomas due to his extensive criminal record. Over the years, he had repeatedly come to their attention for crimes involving women and girls. He first landed behind bars at the age of 18 for assaulting a 12-year-old girl and receiving a four-year sentence, but he was released early, just after a few months. Later, he received a seven-year sentence for assaulting another minor. However, he was released early again this time after serving only six months due to his good behavior. Shortly after, he received a six-month sentence for another assault. Then he attempted to assault another girl on the same day his wife returned home from the hospital with their newborn daughter. The woman later divorced him and obtained a restraining order against Thomas because he had threatened to kill both her and their daughter. Another incident happened when a woman and her little daughter moved to the street where Thomas had lived. One day, the girl, along with her friend, was sitting on the porch of her house. Thomas approached them and told one of the girls that he had been watching her play in the yard and called her a wild girl. Then, he grabbed a stick and began hitting her on the buttocks. The girl ran inside and told her mom about what just happened. The woman saw Thomas through the window and realized she had already seen his face. Before moving to this house, she had checked the sex offender registry in this area, and there was a photo of Thomas. The mother reported him to the police, and the case went to court, but Thomas managed to avoid any punishment for his actions. Before the trial began, the woman was asked not to mention the fact that Thomas was in the sex offender list and had previously been convicted of sexual assault. The reason for this request was the concern that mentioning it would bias the jury, potentially leading to an unfair verdict for Thomas. Just a few months before Sarah's disappearance, Thomas was arrested once again. He had broken into the bedroom of a 24-year-old woman in the middle of the night, undressed, and began pleasuring himself while standing next to her bed. After his arrest, he was released on bail. At first, Thomas successfully hid his criminal history from Sarah's aunt, but she eventually learned about it. Nevertheless, he somehow managed to convince her that all these accusations were false and that he hadn't done anything he was accused of. Considering all of this, detectives had no doubt that Thomas was behind Sarah's abduction. Her relatives also noted that during the time the man was dating Sarah's aunt, he spent significantly more time with Sarah than with the other kids in the house. Back then, no one thought much of it, but after her disappearance, this fact seemed very disturbing. The police wanted to speak with Thomas, so they headed to his place. The man lived just a few miles away, in a shed on his parents' property. Investigators took him in for questioning and also obtained a warrant to search the shed. Inside, there was a mess and horrible living conditions, but no evidence linking him to Sarah's disappearance was found. However, the police discovered a large collection of magazines and DVD discs containing adult materials. The shed was literally filled with them. During the interrogation, Thomas repeatedly denied his involvement in Sarah's disappearance. He claimed that he was trying to deal with his problems, referring to his propensity for committing crimes against underage girls. According to Thomas, during the time he was dating Sarah's aunt, he deliberately avoided being alone with the children so that no one could falsely accuse him of anything inappropriate. When told that Emma had seen him on the night of the abduction, 
Thomas claimed that the girl had often made up stories before, and he wasn't there. Detectives didn't believe a word he said, and it wasn't just because of Thomas's previous crimes. While they were speaking about the disappearance of 11-year-old Sarah, he repeatedly smiled and mocked. The sheriff even thought that Thomas considered his crime absolutely perfect and that the police wouldn't be able to prove his guilt. Thomas also claimed to have a strong alibi. He said he was at the bar with his friend until late into the night. Investigators immediately checked this story, and to their surprise, the alibi was confirmed. Thomas was indeed seen in the bar, but there was a catch. He left around 1 a.m., and since then, no one, including his parents, had seen him until around 7 a.m. During the examination of his phone, they also found that on that night, Thomas had sent messages to several women, offering to meet up, but all of them declined. Despite all of this, detectives still couldn't crack Thomas. They hoped that the girl was still alive, so they put all their efforts into finding her. When they seized his pickup truck, the police immediately discovered several significant clues. Inside the vehicle lay Sarah's green toothbrush and a large lollipop. Investigators thought that Thomas could have used the candy to lure her into his car. The tire tracks also matched with the tracks left in the snow in front of the house on the night of Sarah's disappearance. The man himself told detectives that he hadn't been to that house in over a month, and now they had proof that he had lied. Despite the fact that Thomas continued to deny everything, the police still hoped to find Sarah. Hundreds of officers and volunteers continued searching the area, scouring the territory for many miles around her house. They checked abandoned buildings, forests, ravines, and bodies of water. Canine units with search dogs tried to pick up the girl's scent, while helicopters scoured the area from above. The police also received enormous support from the local community. People came to the police station and signed up as volunteers, despite the bad weather and the approaching holidays. Unfortunately, on that day, the search once again yielded no results. But no one even thought about giving up, and early the next morning, they went out to search for her again. Throughout this time, the stream of volunteers not only didn't dwindle, but grew even larger. In total, 3,000 people joined the search efforts. The sheriff even had to relocate the coordination center to the large baseball stadium because the police station simply couldn't fit such a huge number of people. Notably, among the volunteers were not only adults, but also their children. They handed out water, hot tea, and food. Everyone tried to do their best, hoping that eventually it would help them find Sarah alive. Meanwhile, investigators obtained another piece of evidence linking Thomas to the abduction. As soon as the man was brought to the station, he was given a new set of clothes, and his own clothes were sent to the lab. Experts found foreign DNA on the suspect's underwear and compared it to a sample from Sarah obtained from her belongings. It was a complete match. Considering the fact that DNA was found on his underwear, detectives came to a grim conclusion. Apparently, after the abduction, Thomas sexually assaulted her. The second day of the search also yielded no results, and on the morning of December 25th, Christmas Day, thousands of people once again went to look for Sarah. Despite the holiday, none of them even considered giving up. On that same day, investigators received GPS data from Thomas's phone. Unfortunately, there weren't exact locations, but rather just information about his phone connecting to specific cell towers. Police found out that on the night of Sarah's disappearance, his phone had connected to three towers, allowing them to determine the approximate triangular area where he must have been. Investigators focused all their efforts in this area, which was located practically on the state border, about eight miles from Sarah's aunt's house. This area was mostly covered with trees. Hundreds of people combed through every inch of this territory, hoping for a Christmas miracle that Sarah would be found alive. Unfortunately, reality turned out to be much more tragic. Around 4 p.m., police noticed Sarah's body on the ground, almost at the state border, she lay on her back, with her arms raised upwards, pointing towards the sky. When medical experts began examining the body, even they were shocked. At first, they confirmed the victim had been sexually assaulted. They found signs of strangulation, but determined that the perpetrator had failed to kill her that way. 
In Sarah's lungs, experts found dirt, leading them to believe that the killer had attempted to drown her in a puddle. During this torture, the victim lost consciousness. After that, she suffered severe burns. According to the experts, the perpetrator may have left her lying in the forest for some time, went to get gasoline, came back, and set Sarah on fire. Traces of smoke were also found in her lungs, indicating that she was still alive at that moment. This also explained why her hands were raised and pointing to the sky. This sometimes happens when a person is exposed to fire. Such unimaginable cruelty shocked everyone involved in the case. Even the detectives found it difficult to believe that all these atrocities had truly been committed against the victim. But now, when they knew what had happened to Sarah, all they wanted was one thing, to secure the death penalty for Thomas. Despite the fact that he continued to deny everything, there was an impressive amount of evidence against him. After the discovery of the body, forensic experts found several hairs belonging to Sarah and particles of fabric from her pajamas on the front seat of Thomas's pickup truck, further proving his involvement in the abduction. With all the other evidence, this practically ruled out any possibility of him avoiding punishment. The wait for the trial stretched for more than a year, but it never began. In early 2011, the prosecution decided to offer Thomas a plea deal. Under its conditions, he would admit his guilt and receive a life sentence instead of the death penalty. Considering what he had done to Sarah, this deal might seem unfair. But there were a few serious reasons in favor of such a decision. The main one was that Sarah's younger sister would have to testify repeatedly in court in the presence of the murderer. The abduction and death of her sister became a serious challenge for her, and the trial could have affected her even more. Another reason for offering the deal was that the prosecution could not be 100% sure of securing a death sentence. If Thomas's lawyers had achieved a different verdict, he could have the opportunity to be released someday, which was not part of the terms of the deal under any circumstances. There was another problem. The state governor opposed the death penalty at that time, further reducing the chances of obtaining this sentence. In the end, Thomas agreed and told detectives everything they already knew without him. He admitted that he tricked Sarah into leaving her house with him. Then he took her away, sexually assaulted, and killed her. He received two life sentences without the possibility of parole and was transferred to a maximum security prison. In the first few days, another inmate attacked him with a makeshift weapon during lunch, inflicting several serious cuts. Thomas survived, and prison staff took additional measures to protect him from other inmates who wanted to harm him. Sarah's case sparked outrage because the system repeatedly gave Thomas the opportunities to be released and continue committing crimes. Eventually, the state of Maryland passed Sarah's law which mandates that anyone convicted of child abuse must serve at least 15 years in prison before being eligible for parole. All right, guys, share your thoughts on this story in the comment section, and don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you for watching.